Bet kalispera. Catalano legal in ICO. <laughs> That's all, then I'll switch into English. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, I, I've been coming very frequently to, uh, to Greece, and so I developed a survival Greek, which I found very appreciated by the Greeks, uh, but also made me feel comfortable within the place. And this is something that is an effect that for knowing a foreign language may have. Also for asking, uh, all these words make you feel that you are part of the context, even if you are a tourist. And uh, um, quoting this because I really appreciated what Clea said about this social relations that are the network where uh, education can develop. And it's something that it hasn't been sort of highlighted enough, both in the research work that's been done so far, but also in the, in the areas uh, where, um, for example, um, government should develop best teacher education projects. And sometimes they fail because training is often done in isolation without thinking A, of the context, and B, of the social relations that are being uh, developed and which nurture, actually, all the professional development of us teachers. Having said that, I understand the majority of you are primary teachers, right? Can I have a show of hands of how many primary teachers are here? Oh my God, a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, um, I would like to start by um, providing you some sort of overview of the country I live and work in, <clears throat> in order to establish some parallels and provide a framework for all of you and understand why, in the end, I chose to talk about progression and continuity, which is something I really care for, but in order to share this with you, I need to keep, provide you some information on how I came to that. So let me say something of what I've often been told when I was in Greece. Italia, Grecia, stessa faccia, stessa razza, right? I don't know if they still say that, but we've got lots of similar things, even if we don't share the alphabet. But many of us studied ancient Greek at school, so that's why the link stays. So some of the competencies I developed when I was at school are still there and allowed me to read some Greek when I was here for the first time. So uh, let me give you some sort of general information about what happens in Italy but particularly what happens at the level of primary and in terms of teacher education. Now, uh, in terms of the introduction of foreign language teaching at primary level, we have had a very long tradition. Maybe someone has studied the books of Renzo Titone, who was a pioneer at the, in the 70s about how important it was learning or offering a young learner a foreign language. But starting from that, we had several experimental studies. In 1985, there was a national school reform for primary schools where a foreign language, a foreign, the study of a foreign language was officially introduced in primary schools from the third grade onwards. It was interesting at that time, uh, that was a very rich time for foreign language teachers, um, it was interesting because we never spoke of English at that time. We spoke of a foreign language. And the objective that was stated was to provide learners, young learners, with yet another tool to organize their knowledge and their learning. And I think that was a very precious objective and a precious way to look at what language learning can be all about. Uh, little by little things 
changed. We had other school reforms at primary level. They decided in the 2004 to introduce foreign language teaching from first grade, but foreign language teaching meant mainly English, in spite of the fact that we knew that we had to, had to offer two foreign languages according to the European um, uh, laws. Uh, many parents wanted their children to speak English, and uh, so they, they had to choose and they chose English. So little by little, uh, the teaching of Spanish, French, German vanished. Now things are slightly changing because it's like a pendulum. It depends very much upon something that Kia mentioned, context-related. De depends on the context. Things in the last 12 years have radically changed in Italy, and I think partly even uh, in Greece. I don't know how far the uh, presence of migrant children are uh, is diffused in Greece, but in Italy we have, in some cases in the north of Italy, over 54% of the primary class, which is formed by non-Italian speakers, who have as their own mother tongue, maybe also two or three mother, different mother tongues and different alphabets. Now, that has radically changed the perspective adding yet another perspective to that. Plus, we've got a growing community of Chinese and Arabic speakers in such a way that last year they started experimenting the teaching of Chinese in some primary schools. This is something that should be viewed very positively because if we go back to what's that objective in 1985 was, that is to provide yet another tool. Can you imagine these children working with other alphabets, trying to learn new sounds, to try out new sounds, and their schoolmates, some of them are Chinese. There is a school in Rome where I live and work, which is the, the majority of the school population is composed by Chinese children. It is a very interesting phenomenon uh, because the Chinese migrant population in Rome is particularly keen on learning Italian. I've, I've got a growing number of students in my first and second year at university. I teach in a foreign language degree course um, and the, there is a growing number of Chinese students and many former Soviet Union countries, coming from many former Soviet Union countries. So it, there is a variety, but I anticipate something about what I'm going to say right now. There is a but. There, there are, they are facing, many of these people, these students are facing a problem with the language of schooling. The language that they need to know in order to achieve, uh, to progress in their learning and when they come to university, as Jim Cummings had rightly pointed out almost 20 years ago, they very often fail because they haven't got reinforced their, their language of schooling, which is, in our case, Italian. So now you may understand why I decided to talk about continuity and progression. Because as foreign language teachers, we have a very difficult task and we sort of play a balancing act because we are usually defined as the language people, right? Forgetting that there is the teacher of Italian, in your case of Greek as first language, who is a language teacher and the teacher of maths, of science, of history. They are all using the language. And when we come with our foreign language approach, our colleagues are often surprised. And I think this is something that we should sort of focus upon for our reflections. Having said that, uh, Italy has got a teacher train, a pre-service program for primary teachers, where they, and they started 
uh, a pre-service degree 10 years ago, and but they don't do much work on language learning. They've got English, and they are required to achieve a B2 level with in five years 120 hours, which is nothing, really nothing, right? What happens at primary level for foreign language teachers? Well, who is teaching English? Because we're talking about English, as I said before. Well, the teachers of English are primary school teachers, and there was a high debate about, a hot debate, sorry, about why they should teach English when they hardly knew English and we could have used mother tongue speakers. Well, the debate went on and on, but I, I still think that the choice that was made was positive and maybe the only one available. Um, how do they get their preparation? If they don't attend university, well, they attend a, an in-service training course, which is blended, has got a language component online, so it's very similar to what Kia was talking about, and it's online, and it's connected with a face-to-face -face course with specific uh, teacher trainers. The length is 360 hours. They should, should reach a B1 level, and they are officially asked to uh, take a certification for B1. This obviously clashes with the requirements of the last two years to get up to a B2, and obviously clashes with reality. Because our primary teachers were never taught English. They had to learn it as a start, and people who are 45, 50 years old had to learn English, had to learn English in order to teach it. So these are the contradictions, but I think there are contradictions in every country. Um, what happens with teachers of middle and high school? Well, they attend a university course, a university pre-service course, um, and uh, uh, all these pre-service courses, as well as the, uh, the in-service courses, are never linked together. There is no provision of contact between teachers of different school levels, no provision of contact of teachers of different subject matters. And when I say subject matters, I refer to science, maths, Italian, and English, which is to me a danger because they work in separate compartments. Having said that about the Italian situation, I think I took some notes before when Kia was talking. Yes, more or less this is what happens. Um, what is interesting in the work we developed for primary teachers is that we also developed a sort of profile of the competencies of primary teachers, primary language teachers. Um, almost whole, the whole territory is covered now with teachers who are teaching in their classes also English. One problem. Can you guess what the most important problem for them is? Any guesses for primary foreign language teachers? Language. Sorry? Managing children's classes. Managing. Oh, well, no, that, actually, that's not because they are primary teachers, and primary teachers are the best professionals. In my <laughs> personal point of view, at least in Italy, they are the best professionals. The real problem for them is they are not self-confident with the language they are using. Because they are true professionals, they know that they should be using English correctly. So they are really sort of scared, and it's a matter of self-confidence. We tried out last year, we carried out an experimental um, project where they were exposed, a small group of uh, I think 480 teachers were trained by a special program on the use of classroom language. You know, you go through classroom language to achieve some sort of self-confidence, which was quite important for them because they felt they could say, they could speak. One of them interviewed said, I could even speak for more than five minutes. Now, so you calculate your competence in terms of how long you can speak. 
Having said that, one or two words about my experience. As um, Professor Dendrino said, I was the Italian coordinator for the ELI project, which was a longitudinal project, transnational, where seven foreign, uh, European countries were involved. And we uh, analyzed and observed in each country uh, the progression of uh, uh, young learners from first grade to fourth grade for four years. We, carry, we use different types of tools, we use different types of uh, um, devices in order to observe the classes and to uh, um, get some all sort of inform background information. You were talking about parents. That was, I think, the most important discovery we made Carmen is here, she was in the project, she knows how relevant it was the role of parents, how, what we discovered, not only of, about parents, but about the context, the social context, which helps and sustains and scaffolds their ch uh, children's learning outside the school, because they don't learn only at school, they learn outside school. So I was uh, responsible for this ELI project that provided several types of in background information on children progression. And I'm going to give an example of that. Um, I also uh, um, was the co coordinator of three other teacher uh, national projects, evaluation of um, national evaluation projects at primary, middle, and uh, um, university level. Uh, having said that, you will understand now why I focused on sustaining progression, promoting continuity. Because in a way, the, being teaching at university level, I, I get a double perspective. I've been working as a researcher, in studies, in research studies, I've been working as a teacher trainer, I've been working as a material developer, and I'm now working at university where all those students who have been studying, at least in Italy, for 13 years English, they take an initial entry test, and after 13 years, and I calculated approximately 1,250 hours of English, they sometimes reach a B1 level. So this is very serious. This is what I've called very often, what I, I define language leaks in the system. So I think that if we put all this effort, this quality in primary teacher training, in primary programs, we have to put an extra effort to sustain what they learn at primary level all through their careers. Otherwise, the moment of transition when they go to middle school or high school, they start losing. Losing competencies, losing that drive that is so strong. You're all primary teachers. You know what happens in class when you work with them. They love it. They just love it. So we are. We have to watch carefully at what happens. Right. So I um, put as a title early for lifelong learning because here we've got this lifelong learning over uh, as an over concept, uh, but does early allow us to sustain lifelong learning or to promote lifelong learning? I would answer that it's a long and winding road, echoing the Beatles song. So I'm going to talk about continuity and progression, early language learning in multilingual classrooms. I've already mentioned these topics. And I will focus on some shifts and perspectives in language education and I will end with a question. What can teachers do? Now, this is a picture that I particularly care for, is a young child starting his, her learning path. She's on the point of passing a bridge. And this is her learning career. And uh, it's a long 13 years 
of study bridge. So how can that bridge be strong enough to sustain her experience? Is it going to sustain it? Have we, um, people who are working in this field, sustaining that progress? Uh, a dean in an interview in Blatchford and Howard's book in 1993 said, there are many occasions when there is a lack of appreciation of what children have achieved at a previous stage, at home, at home, or at school. There are also occasions where teachers learn to deal with new situations at the expense of the children they teach. There are situations when teachers are critical of what happened previously and miss the strengths of the past experience. Now, I use this quote because I think it represents what we should care for once we start a process like this one. The project you've just presented is so rich, so strong, that it's such a pity to let it go once they finish primary. Okay, something about continuity and progression. A few questions again. Are language competencies developed, sustained, and reinforced all through learners' school education? How? Are learners aware of and use their second language, their foreign language, but also their first language competencies when moving from one school level to another? We talk about transition from one level to another. How aware are, are our students of what they already have in terms of language competencies in the first and in the second language? And are we providing them with the tools to be aware of that? How is language learning different from subject learning? Because I don't know here in Greece, but in Italy, in when they go from, they pass from primary to middle school, they start learning subjects. And that's a big change. And they are 10 and a half, 11 years old. So the whole situation is different from what they've been exposed to at primary level, where, where there, is, there was this whole learning experience. Do teachers start from what the learners know and teach accordingly at all levels? I'm quoting David Oswell's quote about how we can sustain learning. Is that, is that the case? Does it happen? This is something, something we should ascertain, make sure of. And let's face continuity. What is continuity? And what favors it? What impedes it? And why are we talking about continuity right now, 2013? Continuity has been an issue for the last 20 years, but nobody seems to sort of scaffold it in any way. And we should sort of think about that. What is? Well, it's continuity in terms of content, approach, methodology, attitudes and relationships, assessment, classroom discourse, teaching and learning styles, communication among teachers, students, families and schools. This more or less is what continuity covers in a way. But what favors continuity? Let's see if we agree on that. Well, sharing long-term objectives. Who shares? Teachers, learners, and families. I was so pleased to hear that in these projects, families are totally and fully involved in the, uh, um, in the awareness, the knowledge of the project, what it it involves developing common approaches, working on common joint projects, for example, partnerships among schools. And I think this is a huge community of partners, the one of the project. Enhancing self-assessment tools in learners. That's the only way that, by which students can actually start monitoring their own progress. Uh, establishing meaningful, meaningful contacts among schools, valuing local knowledge, involving parents, and 
Particularly, there should be some sort of collaborative in and pre-service training, not being carried out in terms of separate compartment, as at least is taking place in Italy. Maybe it's not the same thing in Greece, but this is one of the <laughs> negative points. What impedes continuity, I'll go quickly through that. Well, what impedes continuity, lack of contacts with colleagues, families and other schools, lack of attention to students' needs, styles, previous knowledge and competence, lack of knowledge of other school level curricula. Very often when we have meetings with teachers from primary and teachers from middle school, nobody has got a clue of what each other was doing. Um, different assumptions about teaching and learning processes and teachers' defensive attitudes. Why are we talking about continuity now? Well, because the language curriculum is spreading from kindergarten to university. And our classrooms are more and more multilingual and multicultural. We are talking more and more about the importance of language across the curriculum. And we need, because we are required officially by our education system, to provide evidence of learners' achievement. As I mentioned before, in Italy, 13 years of school, over 1,200 hours of English from A1, starting from A1, and reaching a B2, hardly a B, uh, B1, sorry. So there are language leaks in the system. So we need to sustain transition and scaffold continuity. Um, L2 teachers and schools may sustain transition between levels by doing some simple factors, facts. Well, identifying, first of all, indicators of progression in language competence. We have been dealing in the last 10 years mostly with the common European framework descriptors, which we all know were not originally developed for children. They were developed for adults in non-school context. So in a way, many people refer to the common European framework descriptors, but as a matter of fact, we need to uh, develop specific descriptors and indicators of progression in language competence and challenge what the common European framework offers us in order to adjust it to our situation. Teachers may sustain transition by acknowledging learners' achievement, even of partial competence. This is a concept that was certainly highlighted by the common European framework, but it's something that maybe we should devote more attention to, because partial competence is the competence we always have. Our competence is always partial. And it is important to sort of make our learners understand and our and our learners' parents as well that our th their competence is knowing how to do something, but also not knowing yet how to do something else. And this is a concept which is difficult to accept but it provides you with the idea that language learning is an, an always an, a never-ending process. Uh, thus, teachers will gain a deeper and more comprehensive picture of language competence development, and they develop, will develop hopefully shared discourse with colleagues, families, and learners. I'm going back to the interview that I carried out during the early project with the teachers. Uh, teachers were not always the same in the four years, and here I thank Kia for having mentioned the fact that we have to cope with the fact that we will have a never change, always changing body of teachers. And this, why should we bear that in mind? Because in this way we can sort of think carefully of what we are going to discuss with them and how, also in terms of the language we use. And, but teachers, uh, the Italian teachers in the early project uh, were really worried, not only about their own competence, but they didn't have any, any standards because we didn't have any standards. 
and they thought that was worrying. They didn't know how to assess their learners' competence, and they were very thrilled when they saw the tasks that, we, through the LE project, we administered to, our, uh, to the students, to the LE students. And uh, also, they, um, they felt the need of comparing what they felt in the classroom with an outsider like me, for example. I was the researcher, and the researcher can be, there are drawbacks for researcher entering the classroom because it, the researcher can be perceived also as uh, either the fount of all truth or the person who is threatening to report, um, to report to the principal something. It was difficult at the beginning to establish this sort of relationship, but they, they were so eager to establish a level of exchange that they really spoke a lot beyond what we had originally planned in the early project. Um, and uh, I, I, when Kia uh, spoke about this relation, special relationship, I think that what you're doing, your project, is especially meaningful for them because I think that if you are all part of the same community and you've got what you call them, uh, um, I wrote it down what you said, uh, school advisors. Uh, this is a, a term that we don't use in Italy, so I, I wondered whether it was a sort of school-based inspector or just a teacher trainer who works in the school, but teachers must have felt that that was the uh, supportive uh, person for their professional development. This is so important to, to keep. Right, here, oh, this is something that comes from one of the materials I developed at least 15 years ago, and I wanted to share it with you because I had chosen to talk about continuity. Um, I had developed these materials for the transition from primary to middle school. Uh, and uh, together with two other colleagues, uh, co-authors with me of these materials, we started developing sort of portfolios. Are portfolios diffused in Greece? Because these are, if done well, they are very powerful tools. And uh, we were working on uh, materials that they could use in, particularly in the last year of primary, and then take to middle school. And since this idea that children are often asked to leave all they know, all they own outside the school doors, it was important to have to use what they particularly like, these rag sacks, and have them work on the rug sacks, filling it in It's my travel bag. And we asked them to write the activities they mostly liked when they were in the English class, or also uh, the activities that they particularly disliked and what they thought they had learned, and a short description in English of what they thought they could say and write in English. By providing this type of materials, they felt the ownership of the process. And they, that represented something that they were going to present at the beginning of the school year in the first year of the middle school. I mentioned the multilingual classrooms. Well, uh, as I said before, uh, multilingual and multicultural classes, I never sort of divide them, um, where um, is where the country first language is the second or the third language to many children. I already mentioned that. And this is the situation, as I said, in Italy. And uh, as I mentioned before, Cummins warned us about the dangers of not paying enough attention to the parallel development of first and second language or paying attention to the language of schooling. So the language of schooling can become either a strength for them or a threat 
to their success, particularly when the transition is from high school to university. There is where most of the drawbacks occur. And we saw that also in, uh, when we analyzed the last three years entry test results, and we noticed particularly uh, for students uh, of non-Italian origin, they had problems in the general entry test, which was meant to um, to see how um, particular to uh, assess particularly the reading comprehension and the writing skills, and most of the weaknesses were came in uh, the production of these migrant children who were trying to get into university. Maybe it was the way we had developed the tests. Maybe it was. Uh, Mm, lack of preparation at school level. There are many policy issues that we are dealing with now in Italy, the curriculum renewal, teacher education, but particularly system accountability. There I'm very worried about because, again, there are projects as rich as the one Kia has just presented, and then there are ways of uh, controlling and uh, um, assessing learners um, learners um, competencies that are usually use, uh, done through means tools that are not carefully uh, developed uh, we've seen the results in Italy and I think that you were also Greece was also part of the Oxapisa right okay that really sort of thrilled everybody about how poor the Italian students were in most of the um, most of the tests and uh, and then I already mentioned the longitudinal research studies now working in a multilingual class uh, we should put a strong emphasis on language awareness in L1 L2 and L3s of our students and we should put an emphasis on the active position of the learner, which is essential for the development of the lifelong learning skills that I mentioned at the beginning. But because the process of teaching and learning is based much more on than face-to-face -face interaction. Research studies in Italy, I've already mentioned some of the studies I was involved to, in, and but these are the studies that gave me sort of an idea of how to link, for example, this transnational study as the one carried out with Ellie to the results that came from other research studies that were only nation-based. There were no comparisons or sharing with other countries. Um, and among the requests that came out from different studies from teachers, they were asking for tools for carrying out reliable assessment embedded in everyday classroom life, tools to sustain continuity within and across subjects, and tools to scaffold migrant children's learning and language competence. This derived from some of the questionnaires that uh, were administered in two different projects. I will show you very briefly, because I want to emphasize, particularly emphasize uh, um, some of the tools we used in the LE project as a way to show how self-assessment can provide, um, can sustain continuity if carefully devised and carefully used. I will give you an example from the, the task that we developed, the listening task we developed for young learners in the LE project uh, that as I mentioned before, it's a longitudinal study that started in 2006 and was completed in 2010. It lasted four years. And the listening tasks were administered every year from the first to the fourth grade. We paid particular attention to oral comprehension because we think that in a younger learner program, listening provides a basic input for literacy development. It is through oral language that the foundation for learning a new language is established. And listening is becoming now, according to the results we had in the last two years in the exams at university level, 
is one of the skills where our learners are getting lower and lower grades. So this must mean something. Particular attention should be paid to listening. We developed a, cost, a construct uh, in order to measure children's ability to identify specific vocabulary items, comprehend short chunks and phrases with visual support. We had this longitudinal dimension by which we changed the tasks within the year, from one year to another in terms of the complexity of, uh, uh, of the tasks, and we maintained some anchor items. But why am I presenting this here? Because of a very short extract that we devoted to the post-listening questionnaire. We asked our learners, how did you find the first and the second part? The listening task was divided into two parts. What has helped you understand and what has caused you most difficulty? And we provided them with some hints. Were they the pictures, the voices, the unknown words, the background noises? Because one of the things that came out clearly, I think across the seven countries, they very seldom have activity, regular activities on listening, and they very seldom they are assessed on listening. I'm looking at Carmen because we found similarities in our countries. Uh, and uh, teachers were sort of puzzled by the idea of having their, their children take a listening. We called it task, but it was a test as a matter of fact. You know? And uh, they were um, puzzled, but at the same time attracted. They wanted to know more because they had never tried that before. So you see how research can provide some threats, but also um, some challenges that are positive. Um, it was interesting. I'm, I've summarized here what they said. Uh, they said, my comprehension was sustained, and look at the, how they go parallel here, by words I knew, vocabulary, first of all. Voices in the recording, they were not, they were, from, they, they, they heard and understood their concentration. This is something that was added and it was interesting because learners in third and fourth grade are capable of understanding of themselves how they can concentrate. The pictures, but they were also hindered by the speed of delivery and we are, we are all familiar with that. Uh, words I didn't know, task length, and this was maybe a message to the researcher, failure to concentrate, and unfamiliar voices. Some said, and you will see it now, okay. Uh, these are the post-listening and the listening results by which those who found it very easy did it very well. Those who find it very difficult didn't do well. And here are some of their comments. I think it was good, but a bit too easy. Not difficult, make it harder. These two comments don't come from the Italian contingent, I'm sorry. I felt more self-confident in the first part, so they were capable of distinguishing the tasks that were, they were asked. I felt well, but there were a few words I didn't understand. So they identify the words that cause them problems. I couldn't understand some words because our teacher never said them like that. And this, again, is very interesting because they are used to the teacher's voice. Some pupils were noisy and they could not concentrate. Concentration again. Okay, I wanted to show you how, from a sample from the ELI project, uh, these activities that were aimed at eliciting their self-assessment provided us with very important information. So we can say that oral comprehension as a conclusion is linked to the use of multiple classroom oral tasks should be connected to L1 listening. Very seldom developed because it's taken for granted. And very often at university you realize that they are just, we say, you're not listening. 
It's not that they are not listening. They don't know how to listen in the first language. Can be sustained with a variety of oral input, can be monitored through post-listening activity, but mostly, and this comes from research on listening, it develops in the years. So that's why it's important to start well from primary and sustain it. So how can teachers sustain progression? Well, sharing approaches and objectives with students, families, colleagues during the school year and at the end and beginning of new cycles. Planning, time, and providing room for learners' presentation of previous and current experiences, like orientation modules and context frames. This is so important to give them the space to talk and present about what they know. Using transferable activities, because we know that we cycle and recycle, and it's important to see which activities can be transferred also to other levels, and they can be recognized by the learner. Using task-based activities and project work, where they're all involved, recycling tasks to raise awareness of students' progress, finding opportunities for cross-curricular presentations together with other colleagues, colleagues of other subjects. Otherwise, we are in, in a bowl and nothing comes out. And developing language awareness activities and focusing on empowering learners' achievement, working towards the development of learners' individual profiles. So in a way, teachers can do a lot. And you've got a golden opportunity here, all of you with this wonderful project. I think this is something that has to be started, can be started from primary and uh, connections with other school le um, levels of school is so important. Not only letting all the other primary schools know, but letting colleagues. Because, you know, one of the complaints that we usually, I usually hear in Italy is, what the hell are they doing in English at primary level? Have you heard how the teacher pronounces that? Now our learners are quite sophisticated. They are exposed to a variety of inputs from the internet, games of any kind. Particularly parents are very keen on that. So uh, I, f I hear all these complaints about primary teachers and it's sad because primary teachers are usually the best professionals in the system. So it's, it's a pity. So, I've concluded and I try to offer you a perspective from the other side of the little pond, the Tyrrhenian Sea, the Adriatic Sea, sorry, of what we do. I shared with you my worries about things that haven't been working because it's good to share, but I shared with you also some positive sides of it that come from research. And um, in a way, the ELI project, because of it, its longitudinal nature and because we could work and compare with colleagues from seven, six other countries, provided us with a different perspective and a different view. And very often, we came to very similar conclusions for each country, which is quite important. So my personal suggestion is do please spread the word about your project to other school levels, but also to other countries, please. Thank you very much. <laughs>